Okay, so the next speaker is, uh, is Eva Rottenberg. Uh, she has like, a lot of nice uh, dynamic algorithm on like, very fundamental problem, like um, connectivity and two connectivity, and also very impressive result on planarity testing. And uh, today, she's going to talk about that too. Um, and this is going to be based on some technique which she called uh, lazy, grid, lazy Greedy Dynamic Algorithms. So uh, please welcome Eva. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It was, uh, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, let's see if I can see the monitor. OK. So as Kajit Wolf says, it's going to be about um, this lazy, greedy, uh, approach to dynamic algorithms. I feel like that's, um, is the microphone okay? Are you, I think that's a bit of an echo or something. Can you turn it down a little? Okay, it's uh, beyond my powers to change it. All right, so um, let me see if I can change the slide. Interesting. Um. <laughs> <laughs> it, it looks like it's fun, I think. Oh no. Is it out of battery or is it, should I impress this to turn it on? Or? All right. Thanks for bearing with me. Okay, so uh, maybe inspired by being here in Rome with all the old, old stuff and excavations and what have you, I hope you'll join me into a little algorithmic archaeology and go back to the 90s with me, where there's an example of this um, beautiful, lazy, greedy approach. So I'm going to talk about that first, and then I hope you can see the parallels to our uh, fully dynamic planarity testing results uh, that I'm going to then speak about afterwards. Okay. Okay, so what's the, <clears throat> what's the problem I want to talk about first? Um, it's a dynamic problem, but it takes place in a bounded arboricity graph. So assume your graph has bounded arboricity, means that if it has arboricity alpha, it can, the edges can be covered by uh, alpha many forests. So I try to draw them in orange and blue on this picture. And here they are, right? Um, <coughs> and in this situation where you've got a forest, you can always orient the forest towards a root and uh, each of, you can do it on each of these alpha many forests if you have bounded arboricity. So you can make sure that every vertex has out degree, as in how many out edges you have, less than alpha, right? So, so the, what I'm going to talk about first is what if you have a dynamic graph? And the guarantee is that that is always sparse. Can you then update the, impose an orientation on this graph so that the out degree is now O of alpha, right? Uh, in, this, in this talk, I'm going to say six times the arboricity, right? Why is this interesting? Well, it's interesting because it's a, a very natural thing to think about, but uh, I think the original paper talks about that you can then look up um, adjacency quicker, because if alpha is a constant, then you can look up whether a pair of uh, where vertices are adjacent by just traversing these uh, constant-sized list. Um, right. So now I want to give a, this lazy, greedy type algorithm for this problem. Okay. This, 
does it make sense what we want to do? So there's a dynamic graph, it just inserted, it just deleted, it just inserted, it just deleted. At all, po at po at all points of time, we know it's sparse. We know that there uh, can be at most alpha many forests covering all the edges. And we want to maintain this out orientation. So this partitioning into alpha many forests is not given to us. It's just something that we know, okay? And we still want to make this out orientation on uh, this orientation of the edges, so the out edges is bounded. So the algorithm just super stupid. It just runs like this, okay? So if you, de if you have a vertex and you delete an, uh, an edge, right? Whatever, nothing happens. You don't need to do anything. And there's also, you can also imagine that you insert an edge and inserting it doesn't cause any vertex to overflow and it doesn't exceed this O of alpha many out edges. Well, easy, nothing happens. And the only place this stupid algorithm does anything at all <clears throat> is if you insert something and now it has six times alpha plus one uh, out edges, right, then what you do you take all the out edges and you turn them into in edges. Again, really stupid, right? What, what's the problem now? I mean, this cannot work, right? <laughs> One of those out edges that now became an in edge, suddenly this guy is an out edge to someone else, right? Like this. So this might cascade, it might cascade a whole lot, and whatever, then you put whoever is now overflowing, you put him on a stack or a queue or whatever, and then you keep flipping all the edges in until there is no more overflow. Okay. Okay, so this is, this is a very nice introduction to dynamic algorithms. I use it in Algorithms 3 class for undergrad students, and it, it works. They, they, they pick it up, right, more or less. And it's, it's funny because this algorithm is super easy to understand or implement. And if it actually terminates, it's clear that it's correct. But it's not clear that it terminates uh, until you actually do the analysis. <laughs> All right? All right? So I hope everyone is on the same page with me. Um, OK. So how do we analyze it? Well, we look at something a bit more, uh, a bit tighter. So let's consider maintaining an, a two alpha out orientation instead, right? So we know theoretically we can make an alpha out orientation. Let's maintain a two alpha out orientation. And this number two is not from the paper, it's just to make it even more simple. Okay, you can imagine it being alpha plus one if you want or something. But let's just say two alpha. <clears throat> now uh, once, okay. So let's analyze an algorithm, and it doesn't need to be efficient. We're just talking about existence here. Um, that maintains a two alpha out orientation. Now if a vertex has a out degree strictly more than two alpha, we, we need to find some augmenting path and augment that. And we want that path to be not too long. So for this reason, <clears throat> Let's think about uh, if there is a vertex of out degree more than two alpha. Then the lemma is there is also a path of length log n to some vertex whose, uh, whose out degree is strictly smaller than two alpha. And that's what we want because then you think about, then you want to like augment that path. And again, this is not an efficient algorithm. I just want to say that it exists is a recourse analysis, and then later I'm gonna use that to analyze the stupid, greedy algorithm. Okay, so why is this the case? Well, first of all, such a vertex with uh, less than two alpha out edges does indeed exist. It's a counting out argument on the edges. We have obesity alpha, can't be too many edges in total. And secondly, it's, it must exist close by. So consider now, uh, you have this vertex U, who is overflowing, right? And then you can look at its out neighbors and the out neighbors of its out neighbors and the out neighbors of its out neighbors of its out neighbors, etc. And 
<clears throat> these are like these eggshells or no, sorry, onion onion rings around our vertex U. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> ah, they they were supposed to turn slightly blue when I press. Okay, so if you look at the eyes layer of this onion, um, well, if if, it if either of them contains this vertex V with a low degree, low out degree, then we're done, right? We, find the, we found the augmenting path. And otherwise, I'm claiming that they will contain at least uh, two to the i vertices, uh, the i-th layer, okay? Why? So you can do this by induction. So <clears throat> let's uh, make induction over j because I put i in the statement there. So, so, so we assume that um, the j's layer has two to the j vertices, and we're not done. So we're not done, that means everyone has two times alpha out neighbors. So we consider all those two times alpha outages for each vertex uh, of vj. So there's two times alpha times the number of vertices we had in there. And now because we had a bounded arboricity, we know we can cover all those edges with alpha many forests. So that, can't, that has to give a lower bound to how many vertices you fit in there. I mean, the worst that can happen is that they are all trees. So <clears throat> we have each, I mean, we, can, we have those x many edges must take up at least x over alpha many vertices, right? And now you see the alpha divides out, right? And that's uh, two to the j plus one. And that is our lower bound on the number of vertices in now the next layer of this onion, right? So after log n steps, we must have covered, where we keep being unlucky, we have covered the whole graph. So clearly, I mean, clearly we have found like this path that we can augment. I hope this, I hope this makes sense. Right? So this just shows that if we are allowed to spend linear time after each update, then indeed the recourse is low. We can make a two alpha orientation where we only change a little bit, uh, only change log n edges after each update. Right. Oh, fun fact. So you can say you do it after each insertion, or you can say you do it after only after deletion because you can think of it the timeline reversed, but yeah, that's a, that's a little philosophical thing you can think about afterwards. So, so how do we use it to analyze the really stupid algorithm? Well, what did it do? It said when you had an overflow, as in more than six alpha many out edges, then you flip in all edges and you keep going until you are safe again. Well, recall that this two alpha algorithm, it made only log n flips per operation, and now we don't want to actually compute it. We just want to use it for the sake of the analysis. Right? Imagine it exists. We know it exists. And I'll look at the situation where we're trying to make, where we have an overflow. Right? We can say, we can look at the edges, and we will not know which edges are good or bad, but we want to use this notion for the sake of analysis. So I say that an edge is good if it agrees with the, this omniscient algorithm that we analyzed before. If it turns the same way as this omnipotent algorithm that no one knows how to implement fast, then it's a good edge. If it disagrees, if they turn different directions, then it's a bad edge. So what happens when we have an overflow situation and we need to flip? Well, we have six alpha out edges of the vertex. And this algorithm that we are using for the sake of the analysis will have two alpha. So there must be at least al uh, four alpha bad edges that will now become good, and at most two alpha good edges that will now become bad. So we have gained by this process. And, and clearly, if we are used to potential arguments, right, this is uh, the, the number of good edges uh, <clears throat> increase. 
if we do this flip. So since the other algorithm used login uh, flips per, per edge update, this one is just a constant factor worth. It's also O of login flips per edge update. And um, this is a very simple, almost toy-like problem to look at. And the, the take-home message from this, um, from this old algorithm is that it, it really pays to make a recourse analysis and then use it to, to analyze your, your greedy, lazy, stupid the dynamic algorithm. Okay, I hope everyone followed that because this is like very simple. And teach it in your ALGO 3 class. It's a, it's a really nice breaker for students who want to uh, study dynamic algorithms for the first time. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about something way more complicated where we use the same idea, okay? So, <clears throat> planarity testing. There's been a lot of results in the early 1900s about characterizing planar graphs and you probably have, each of you have your favorites, not necessarily the same. Uh, there's a linear time algorithm for it that's almost turning 50 now, I guess. Wow. Um, even for this uh, online or incremental setting where the edges or vertices are, arrive one by one is uh, solved. It's uh, alpha time, just like connectivity. <laughs> and, um, and then there's been some work on the fully dynamic case where uh, the, there's a very nice reduction from the thing I cite here from the 90s again uh, that I will show you in a moment. And um, today I'm going to talk about how we do the fully dynamic version in polylog update time. And what is, so planarity testing is just the yes, no answer to whether the graph is, uh, is presently planar. So say you have a graph, then someone comes and inserts, say, the edge from house two to water. So now it's planar, right? Now someone inserts the edge, uh, house number two to water, insert, it's still planar. I want to update the answers. Yes, it's still yes. Now someone inserts this edge. Now the answer is no, it's not planar. Someone deletes maybe the, the edge from the first house to electricity. I want to update the answer. It's now planar again. Dynamic planarity testing, that's what the problem is. And this is the thing that we recent, ah, two years ago solved um, in polylog update time, improving uh, upon polynomial time algorithms. Okay, and the fun fact about this is that we actually maintain uh, an embedding uh, in the affirmative case. So not actually an embedding, but some information about uh, an embedding. Okay, now I want, again, archaeology. There's this beautiful reduction from the 90s. So there are these two versions of the problem. One is the one I just said, yes, no answer. You want to say yes, the graph is presently planar, or no, the graph is uh, not presently planar. This is the first version, right? Now the answer is not planar. And there's another way to think about the problem, where if uh, the adversary or the user says, I want to insert this the uh, final edge in the K5, you say, nope, you're not allowed to do that, can't have a pony, this edge does not belong, um, reject this edge. And these two problems are equivalent. And there's a very beautiful reduction I'm gonna show you now uh, that reduces them. Okay, and only, it's an amortized reduction, sorry. Uh, and, but I'm gonna only do amortized stuff anyway. So uh, the an advantage of the second one is of course that it is at all times planar. So you have an embedding. You may not want to update the entirety of the embedding, but you can update some information about the embedding and use that. Okay. So has an, we're gonna actually have an embedding. So what is the reduction? So Remember, I want to say that if you can safely just reject edges that violate planarity, then you can also answer the yes-no question. So, we maintain a planar subgraph, and we maintain a drawer full of stuff where we reject it. Q. Oh, it's a cloud or a drawer, whatever. Okay, 
So when inserting an edge so that it violates planarity, we reject this edge, we just put it in a drawer. And uh, when someone deletes an edge, we may have Okay, and then we, whatever subsequent uh, edge insertions you have, you can also put them in a drawer because you know it's not planar. And whenever something is deleted, we, we have to try elements from the drawer until either the drawer is empty or we found a new witness. So now the, the graph is, the answer is yes, the graph is planar if and only if the drawer is empty. Uh, and thus, uh, this planar subgraph is equal to the entire graph. That's a reduction. Huh? Isn't it nice? So, <clears throat> uh, the amortized number of updates to P or Q, well, an edge arrives, worst thing that can happen, it ends in the drawer once, and then it comes out of the drawer once and into P, right? So, it's uh, amortized the same. Okay, so it's enough to maintain a planar graph and reject the edges that are not planar. So again, let's think of, it's just like this toy uh, example, I shouldn't call it toy example, like the example from uh, previously, right? If you want to delete it, just delete, delete. It's easy, the graph was planar, the graph is planar. If you want to insert it, just again, we have a safe case and a uh, more intricate case. So if you want to insert an edge, sometimes you're lucky, it just goes smack across a face and you just insert it. Hmm? Sometimes you're less lucky, like this one. So now you have to change the embedding. And now I, I say, I'm doing some flips to change the embedding. Like I flip like this, like this, and like this, and I say this has three flips. It sounds like it's m more than just three flips because a lot of m vertices move around in the plane, but we'll get to that. And uh, these changes to the embedding, as you just saw, can be necessary. Um, so what we did in our result is we uh, have a greedy algorithm that uses amortized log n flips, and we find these flips each of them in worst case log squared n time. So <coughs> embedding and flips. Right, so when I say embedding, I mean uh, combinatorial embedding. So you got a vertex and you got the edges around the vertex and you want a circular ordering around the vertex of uh, which edge goes between with which other edges. Okay, so think of these uh, three embeddings of the same graph. C can you tell me which ones? Are any of these identical? Are they all different or what's going on? Think about it for a moment. Okay, hint, two of them are identical. So, and then it becomes easy to see uh, once I say it that, well, the ones where the orange vertex and the white vertex are in different phases, are identical, right? And the ones where they're in the same phase are not. Okay. So, that is what I mean by an embedding, and this is the kind of embedding that I can make few changes in. So, how do we actually change an embedding? Well, one thing is that you can have a cut vertex also called an articulation point. And then that cuts the graph into two parts. And you can think of taking one of the parts and moving it into another face of the rest of the graph, like this. Hmm? And you can also think about having a pair, a cut pair, also called a separation pair, a pair of vertices who uh, separate the graph. Then you kind of have a cycle going vertex, face, vertex, face again, around a subgraph. You can think of mirroring that like this. Mm -hmm. And then you've got, I mean, and this is clear that we want these flips. We want to maintain these flips because the vertices that were, um, you could insert an edge between are different now. Some vertices shared a face before, some other vertices share a face now. We need those flips. And, and luckily, I, as I said, 
in the early 1900s, like first half of the century, so much stuff got, went on into, into graph theory and studying planar embedding. So we're standing on the shoulders of giants here. Okay, so with enough of these flips, these, um, you can change any one embedding to any other embedding of the same graph. And we use this notion of flip distance, how many, <clears throat> between the two embeddings of the same graph, that distance is how many flips you need to take to get from one to the other. And furthermore, the data structure version that was uh, actually my uh, master thesis, <laughs> Uh, first paper was um, that you can actually maintain an embedding of uh, a planar graph subject to this uh, update so that a user can come in and say, now I want to flip, you know, I want to perform one of these two times of flips. And we can support that efficiently, log squared in time per, per update, and you can still answer to these vertices uh, share a phase with which phase and so on. Okay, so now we know what we mean by flips, and in fact, we can verify that the flips I talked about before are indeed flips. Hmm. Okay, the question now is, uh, what kind of uh, upper and lower bounds do we get? So, so you almost had it right. You can this looks like a ladder, a ladder graph, a one by n grid graph, and it sounds, it looks like you can almost see it, right? That, you can get an O of N lower bound for the worst case. I mean, you, someone gives you a ladder, you draw it in the worst possible way you get, you can force them to, to do O of N many flips, and that's also the case, right? But how about amortize? What if, if you give me the graph, then I'm allowed to draw it in the plane, then you give me the edge. How many, how many, um, uh, how many flips can you force me to make to accommodate the edge? And now that's a lower bound of only login. And how do you get that lower bound? You take, take two binary trees, identical binary trees, and glue them together by the leaves. You can just make them complete binary trees. And now you can take one arbitrary point and then zigzag into the furthest face and say you want to insert that edge. That's, all, that's uh, data of, of login, many flips you need to do to insert the edge. Once you've inserted the edge and deleted the edge again, it's gonna look, I mean, up to relabeling exactly like it was before, so you can keep, keep going. So there's a log n lower bound here. And what we showed uh, in Soda two years ago is that this is tight. So give me a graph. I can carefully embed it into the plane so that when later you come and give me any edge to insert, I only have to perform log in, log in many of these flips in order to accommodate the edge and put it into the drawing. And not just put it into a drawing, but put it into a drawing and fix the embedding so that I'm ready again to take any new edge you throw at me and perform again only log in many flips. And this goes both ways, insertion and deletion. Um, this is a recourse analysis. <laughs> Insertions we can indeed do efficiently, but when we talk about deletions, oh no, that's, we, we could not do that. We could not do efficiently figure out how to, to roll back. Of course, the existence is just an existence and it holds both ways, right? Okay, so, so that's, do, do we want to take questions now or do we want to? Go on, Guy. Well, you were saying that the diameter of this um, this group of uh, embeddings is log squared, if I'm not mistaken, by flips, where you have this group. It's log n. It's log n mini flips, not log squared. Log uh -huh. squared is what we additionally, to, to find each of these flips, we need log squared n time. Hmm? So the diameter of this group of flips is logarithmic? and it has a center. I'm just look, trying to understand it from an algebraic point of view. It has, yeah. a, it has a center from which the radius is logarithmic and you can find it using your algorithm. So you're asking whether the, the set of all embeddings has a logarithmic radius and that's not the case. Uh -huh. okay. It's just that, <coughs> yeah, uh, it's, that's not the case. And I'll, I have a picture where I'll go back to your question and I'll just talk about it when I have the picture, okay? 
Okay, thanks. Yeah, so let me just tell you what the greedy algorithm is, because as, as we talked about, you use the recourse analysis to analyze something really uh, damn stupid, so it's, I don't know if it's stupid. I, we did spend, had to spend a lot of work on it also, but more stupid work than the others. The other is more deep work, and then there's more stupid work, I don't know. So when you delete an edge, just delete it, it's still planar, and then when you attempt to insert an edge, well, uh, it's not so easy to just uh, find the flips you need. And here, just to give an overview of how the greedy algorithm works, you notice that all the, the flips, the flip locations relevant to this insertion, they have a linear order from one endpoint of the edge to the other. And now I've drawn the biconnected case that's, it's not necessarily biconnected, that could be articulation points, and they also have a linear order, but just, you know, the, the biconnected case, or the, the two vertex flips are the most difficult to find, so I've drawn those. And as you can see, it's not even just one type, there can be many ways things can go wrong. And then you find, and now here no flips are necessary, but whenever you look at a separation pair, you could like imagine in your head that it had been uh, drawn in the wrong out of the two ways. Right? So you find these flips, uh, you kind of flip in subsets that are nested by inclusion along the way. And uh, if you're stuck, then we show that you will indeed find the same flip two times. And then we can reject the edge. Uh, that is, if the resulting graph is not planar. Uh, otherwise, we find each of these flips in log squared in time, one by one and eventually we will reach an embedding where the edge can be inserted. And Jakob had this comment that the, the way that we have, we maintain a balanced embedding is kind of analogous, analogous to how splay trees, uh, splay trees maintain a balanced binary tree. I think one of our students says that the depth of a uh, node in a splay tree is amortized log. <laughs> like that's the kind of balance we get. <clears throat> so, here's the picture I wanted to show you. So here you have um, your balanced embedding. You have a lot of weird embeddings, and they can be ugly. Uh, and we, I don't say anything about this diameter being small of the huge light blue blob here. I'm saying that there exists a subset, and they are the balanced embeddings. And they have the property, and now next to it I drew uh, G prime, which is the G plus minus one edge. And they have the, the property that they are only logging away from a place where you can insert an edge. And then via inserting the edge, you, you jump from one ball to the next ball. And then you are again in a balanced embedding of G, G prime, which is now this plus minus uh, edge version of G. That's what I'm saying. So I'm not saying that the diameter of the embedding graph is, is bounded. But I'm saying something about how these, you can imagine each graph having an embedding, an embedding world, and that I say there's a core of the embedding world, and those cores are not too far away somehow. So, okay, uh, balanced embedding, it's uh, the flip distance from a balanced embedding of G to some balanced embedding, for each balanced embedding of G to some balanced embedding of G plus minus an edge. That is log N, O of log N. I think it's two log N or something. And that means we can now, again, similar to before, have a potential uh, that reflects the distance from some embedding to its nearest, to a nearest balanced embedding. And this is the potential that makes the analysis of the other this, the greedy algorithm work. Okay, because if the greedy algorithm does k many flips, so the potential must um, have decreased by k, except that there's this log factor. Okay, so it must have decreased by k minus all again because of this argument. Because these distances are distances still. 
This is just this is just distal source. Okay. Ah, I like this, right? So so let's let's again draw these the world of G, the world of G1, the world of G2, etc. They all we've done K many insertions and deletions, right? And then we have this flip path of the greedy algorithm. I try to draw that in uh, purple. Ah, this is a lazy one that when you in, when you delete an edge, it does nothing. And there you look at the green path. It's the one that goes from balanced embedding to balanced embedding, always eager to be inside where it's nowhere safe, right? And clearly that eager one, it, it moves around more. It's a basic distance uh, argument. So uh, if, if any sequence of uh, T greedy updates uh, that starts in a balanced embedding does T uh, log in many flips simply because of this distance argument. Okay, so I have five minutes left, six, six, ah, six minutes left <laughs> um, to talk a bit about why these balanced embeddings indeed exist. Okay, now we all feel like, I, I always thought they were interesting, but now we really feel like we can use them for something algorithmic. Okay. So this result can be also stated like this. Every label planar graph has a canonical embedding so that if uh, the two graphs differ by just one edge, the flip distance between these canonical embeddings is O of log n. So how do we do it? Uh, we are back to our old friend connectivity. So let's, this, is, this is supposed to be a three vertex connected graph. And uh, three vertex connected graphs, they have unique planar embeddings. So what we should look at is, of course, the tree of the three vertex connected components and how they relate to each other, and try to use that to, to talk about the whole class of embeddings and which ones we like and which ones we don't. So before I talk about three vertex connectivity, let me talk about two vertex connectivity. So a cut vertex is a vertex whose removal disconnects a connected graph or a con component. And the cut vertices, <clears throat> if you recursively find all cut vertices in a graph, you partition the edge sets into blocks. So we have blocks, we have bridges, we have uh, cut vertices. And this is the BC tree, and it's uh, just the graph over this structure. And this Block cut vertex tree describes, of course, all these articulation flips that might sometimes be necessary. As in, you can put in some extra information on each cut vertex of who's, into, who's going into what phase of whom, and, and then you can reconstruct uh, something about the embedding out of that, right? Similarly, the Two, the two cut vertex pairs or the separation pairs, they split the graph into something called the SPQR tree. And that's because it's a bit more intricate now. You, have, uh, you can have that several cuts share the same vertices in different ways. This is really well studied by the graph drawing people. And, and these separation pairs, they tell you all about these separation flips, of course. And you can imagine now in this example I drew down here, it's just like one bit. Is it flip? Is the hard flip this way or that way? And that it can be a bit more intricate, but not much. And then <clears throat> note that these are unique, and uh, it's it's easy to see that it, you, when you insert an edge, then you if you need to change some things, all these things that lie on one path in the SPQ uh, in the B. BC uh, tree, and for each block that they intersect, it's one path in that SPQR tree of the block. But what we show is also that there exists a way to make the local choices in each block and each um, in these trees, so that uh, at most login choices need to change their choice when you insert a new edge. And the way we do it is our good friend heavy path decomposition. So uh, imagine rooting these arbitrarily, and then we say uh, uh, an edge is heavy if the child is more than half the, the, the size, the number of vertices, say, than his parent. And that means that you can, uh, you can 
force a path, any path in this tree to be solid by changing O of log n many edges from being uh, light edges to forcing them to be act like, uh, like uh, heavy edges. And now what we do is whenever we have a solid path, there were some choices we needed to make. We needed to say like, is the heart turning like this or like that? We make them so that it is easy to later insert an edge that covers the whole solid path if possible. We can do that. It's, it's not as trivial as I said here, but some, something like that is the idea. And that means that whenever you insert an edge, well, all the solid edge choices were the right choices, and you don't need to uh, change those. Okay. It sounds like we're done, but we forget something. So what happens when we actually, so okay, we can insert one edge, but what happens when we actually insert the edge? Okay, ah, here's a picture of like how the SPQR trees are inside each block and the blocks are the block cut tree, right? What happens when we actually insert an edge? Well, clearly, a pair of vertices, if they were not three vertex connected before, their connectivity will increase. And it might incur drastic changes to the PC tree and the block cut tree, right? So here's an example where we insert an edge, and all of a sudden these vertices are three vertex connected. And that means that in, a, in our entire path, maybe O of n log, long path in the, in the SPQR tree, collapses into one conglomerate, rigid, three vertex connected component. And that sounds like it will have drastic consequences to who has, a, uh, who has a heavy child where, and all these flips might have to cascade and change. So luckily, we can get around it. So whenever we have a heavy path, we make sure it's sort of like ready for contraction. Because when you, if you look at it again, it isn't like everything is contracted. It's sometimes some of the vertices are like, an, some of the things along the way need to sort of be split off when this contraction happens. And we can pre-split them off so that everything is indeed uh, ready for contraction upon an edge insertion if the edge insertion covers a heavy path or for each, whenever it covers heavy paths, this is already ready. And yeah, <clears throat> so this is, we define our embedding based on these pre-split um, SPQR trees and block cut trees, and it's like uh, deriving red black trees from one, two, three, uh, two, three four trees. It, it works out. Okay, and that's the main technical result. It uses these, um, but the thing is when we actually do the this is just this recourse analysis. When we actually use it for dynamic planarity testing, we do not maintain these block cut trees or these um, SPQR trees. They only serve in this more technical result. Okay. So the conclusion is we gave a data structure that uh, maintains planarity testing. On edge deletion, it does nothing. When you try to insert an edge, it only does flips that improve the embedding, up to maybe log in that don't, and it uses worst case log squared n time per flip and amortized log cubed n time per edge update. And this way, um, yeah, so we got this by analyzing the recourse, how many changes must be, can be necessary in order to make the update. So the strategy in retrospect, one thing is you need to like find the way, right thing to maintain dynamically, like this combinatorial embedding in our case. Then you analyze the recourse, and then you use the recourse analysis to analyze a greedy algorithm, and you also have to, I really swept this under the rug, but you also have to give a greedy algorithm. It was not super simple. Um, and there are a lot of related open questions. For instance, this, the natural one, worst case. Can we do this worst case? Then we need to make some changes when someone deletes an edge. Uh, can we have a maximal planar subgraph efficiently? Uh, so then we cannot just put things in a drawer. We need to <laughs> be a bit more eager in that manner. 
can we um, <clears throat> can we maintain three connectivity? Can we actually have this whole SPQR tree and update that when edges are inserted or deleted? Um, and the list goes on, and I didn't even put a dynamic graph drawing in there. There's a whole bunch of questions in graph drawing that have linear time solutions. Take your favorite, update it uh, dynamically. That's also open. Um, here's a philosophical one. So we want to answer planarity testing, and we do so by when yes, having a, a planar embedding. And it's similar to the question of when you answer um, connectivity, you more or less do so by having a, a, a spanning forest. Or, or, and and, and I, I wonder, like, both questions. Is that really always the way to go, or can you save some time by not having the spanning forest, by not having the embedding? And we have log cubed here, right? Could be log, I don't know. Um, and now uh, other problems, uh, right, another completely different thing is that sometimes planar graphs admit more efficient algorithms than general graphs. So now we know dynamically whether the graph is still planar. Can we then also maintain, I don't know, six coloring of, of it dynamically? And the, the answer to that is no, but may maybe, maybe there are some other questions about uh, planar graphs that can be now updated. And uh, this gray, lazy, greedy thing, what else can it solve? I also want to, to know that. Right. And with that, I thank you. And um, this is joint work with Jakob Holm, who cannot be here today because he's uh, having exams. He was just here yesterday. Um, and if you want to come work with us in Copenhagen, you can always write. And we are also looking for postdocs. So. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Question for Eva. So I have a short question, actually. So about this edge orientation, is it known how to do it in worst case time too? The question is about uh, worst case edge orientation. There are results on that, but uh, I, can, I can find you some papers. I think we has look at that together with co-authors. I'm just wondering if, if, there is, if that can be done, maybe you can kind of use the same approach for planarity testing. Uh, I don't know. Ah, uh, then you're wondering if you can use the same approach for planarity testing, and I don't. So, so I, I don't know how to do it for planarity testing, it's, especially if you want it to be still deterministic. Um, maybe if you use randomization, I can imagine that you maybe insert some random edges in a well-chosen way whenever you would perform a deletion so that you force your algorithm to, I mean, inserting an edge can some sort of be proved now. This inserting an edge can never really hurt you. So if you try at random to insert some edges, maybe you can uh, like shrink the graph a bit uh, or push it further towards being balanced. Um, but yeah, if you want it to be just deterministic, then I really don't know. But I think you have to maybe maintain the actual uh, buck country and the SPQR trees of each component. If we get to that, then I think we might be closer to, to deterministic. But I, I don't think that's just a, an analogous way to do it, yeah. Right, very good question, Guy. So Guy is uh, asking whether we can have dynamic optimality, similar to the question that I think is still not solved for splay trees, right? Are they dynamically optimal? Uh, and that's also a very good question, and I, I feel like this should be dynamically optimal because it's so lazy, 
and it doesn't do anything unless it really has to. But uh, yeah, let's let's show that. <laughs> I'm game. <laughs> yeah, good question. Thanks. So so dynamic optimality means that the optimal sequence of flips done by the optimal algorithm that knows everything in advance is also matched asymptotically by the one we present here. That's the question. And I think, why not? <laughs> All right, so just a short announcement. Um, so we will come back again at, uh, ten, like we will start again at 10.45 and the last session actually uh, after the talk by Thomas is gonna be a uh, junior senior meeting. And uh, if you are interested, uh, just put your name in the spreadsheet of, of, the, of the workshop website. Okay, so thank you, Eva, and uh, we meet again soon.